Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about the class structure and the gradings and the extra credit, went over the Canvas site and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so now what I want to do is talk a little bit about what, what, what do I mean by bizarre and extreme behaviors. You know, talk about some examples of that, sort of get a preamble to some of the things we're going to talk about in class. And then uh, we're going to get next, next week on to personality disorders and then the next week after that into psychosis a little bit. So um, show you some images of things. I like to put this image up. Um, this is a religious snake handler. This is what uh, Harley's going to talk about in his lecture. And this is a guy who is belongs to a certain uh, variant of Christianity where they take a couple Bible uh, uh, lines in the Bible, literally, where it says, thou shalt take up serpents. And these guys take this seriously. And they have poisonous snakes that they grab out of a box and hold and pass around, and these are uh, rattlesnakes, copperheads, water moccasins, these kind of snakes that they have in the East Coast. Most of these guys are in Appalachia. Appalachia, by the way, it's pronounced Appalachia. Um, my, my relatives, my mom's side, are from Appalachia, so I have some, some sympathy for these guys. Um, uh, so this is an interesting thing. So again, this is something, if you saw somebody wandering around a campus here with a bunch of snakes, and poisonous snakes, rattlesnakes in their hands, you might think that's a little abnormal, right? But if you're in the hollers of West Virginia on a Sunday morning in a church, this would seem quite normal. Okay? So one of the things I want to get across in this class is something that we'll call relativity, cultural relativity. Okay, that things that are normal in one culture may be abnormal in another one, this may also apply to time periods, historical periods, et cetera, et cetera, geographical areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So very interesting thing, because we would think this is probably pretty abnormal. Right? So one of the things we can think of is a human behavior lies in a continuum from normal to what we think of as deviant. The problem is what we think of as extremes do not have universal definitions. Okay? do not have universal definitions. And this is in, in contrast to things like religion, a lot of academic areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where we have universal truths, okay? This is not true when we start talking about human behavior, okay? We don't have universals. We have consensus about things. So in this time, place, and consensus, we may have consensus about a certain behavior. For instance, a woman walking naked in the street, right? We have some consensus about what we think about this behavior. Okay. Other place, other time may have a different consensus about this. So again, what we're really talking about is consensus. We're not talking about universality. Okay. And there's been a lot of things throughout history, throughout cultures, that include this, examples of things. And one would be nudity. Homosexuality is another one. Even pedophilia, I mentioned to you earlier about the ancient Greeks. Um, even things, something as extreme as that. You know, again, different, different viewpoints. So in order to understand the behavior, we need to understand its cultural and psychological context. Okay? Context is very important. And by nature, looking at these contexts is interdisciplinary, includes not only psychology, but medicine, anthropology, sociology, biology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And I like to do this example. So if you saw this nice woman walking around campus here naked, stark naked, what would you think? What would you do? Yeah, what would you do? You live in California. So some people will say, hey, I don't care. That would be really true if you're in Northern California. Nobody would care. I went to a school where people were walking around naked. There was a class that was called Suntan Psychology. <laughs> that was, that was, it was like Psychology 101 or something. And it was called Suntan Psych. And the professor held it outside in a quarry. And on the sunny days, students would take their clothes off and just sit there naked, get a sun bath, and listen to the professor, professor lecture. That's actually a real thing that happened. Okay? Uh, but what, what, let's say this woman is walking out in front here on the front drag in front of the library. What, 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 would, what, would, what would happen? What do you think would happen? Everybody would be staring at her. Yeah. What else would happen? They'd stare at her. What else? And yes. Would they, call the campus police? they would call the campus police. Yeah. What else might happen? Yeah. Who else might get a call? Ask her if she's okay. Ask her if she's okay. <laughs> Assume something is wrong. Yes. Post what else? Social media. Post on social. You definitely know that would be happening for sure. Yeah. Well, where, where can you post post these pictures on social media? Definitely with Twitter or Instagram. Which one allows nudity? Both. Both allow nudity. See, I'm not, I'm not up on this stuff. 
right? So you're, my son does all this stuff, and I don't know anything about it, and that's on purpose. <laughs> okay. What else might happen? Who else might get a call? Psychological services. You might think she was, in, you know, something wrong with her or something going on, right? So that would probably be the case. An assumption about this. Uh, could she be arrested? Yeah, public indecency, whatever. It was only until uh, up until I think maybe last year um, that it was legal to be naked in San Francisco. You could walk around like this girl, completely naked in San Francisco, and the only requirement was that if you sat in a public bench, you had to put a towel down before you sat down. It's completely legal. And I often thought, as I've been teaching this class, I should test this out and walk around naked. I didn't know. And then I believe they changed the law. Okay? But I believe down here, I believe this is really something that would be illegal. This person could be arrested for this. Right? What, what other reason could she be doing this for? Yeah. Um, activism. Activism. Protest. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Right? And we had people do this before. Activists who took their clothes off. The most notorious recent ones are the PETA people, animal rights people, right, who would um, put themselves naked in a cage on a street in New York City and, you know, say this is for, you know, or walk around in a blood spattered fur coat with nothing on underneath, right? There are some cases of this stuff to be a form of activism, right? Yes, active protest. You know, you know, they're, she's being, she's being, you know, she's being, um, you know, controlled by the patriarchal male-dominated society, and she's going to show her resistance to that by taking off all her clothes, right? Uh, there were cases where uh, women were breastfeeding in public, and they got in trouble. And they protested by going in public and breastfeeding and burying their breasts and breastfeeding, right? So that actually has happened on this campus. My wife, when my son was a baby, was on campus and was breastfeeding in a class she was taking here. And somebody, another student in the class complained to the instructor that she was breastfeeding. And, um, and that wasn't the only time that happened. And then people complained to the president, said breastfeeding is perfectly okay. Babies need to have their lunch, right? And so now you'll see on campus we have lactation rooms and places where, you know, women can go and be out of public. But if a woman is breastfeeding in this class, would anybody here care? Some of you might, some of you might not, right? But I believe there is something now, maybe in California, that, that says, I think there was actually before, there's an ordinance that says it's okay for women to breastfeed. Okay. And, um, there are places where uh, that's not allowed. Okay. So again, some differences there. She could be doing a prank. We don't have football teams here, or like big football teams. But, you know, you've heard of streaking. Where people take their clothes off and run down in the middle of the field and they do it as a prank. When I was in college, again, back in the Jurassic era, <coughs> that was a thing people did. I went to UCLA for a little while and that was a thing people did. UCLA football game on a dare or whatever, a fraternity, sorority, they stripped their clothes off, run out in the field. Cops would catch them, all right, don't do that, you know, get them a little bit to go see the dean students or something. It was a prank, right? So there would be lots of different contexts for this behavior, which is out of the ordinary. I mean, I look around. <coughs> Look around the room right now, and I see that there's no naked people in class. You know, there's nobody naked in here. We run over to the bathroom and grab some stuff. Um, uh, that's pretty good, actually. No naked people. I also notice there's nobody beating the crap out of anybody else here either. Right? Remember your Freudian psychology, right? One of the two things that Freud talked about that are really important, that motivators of human beings, eros and thanatos, right? You know, sex and violence, right? Interesting, nobody here is doing those things. They're quite common things. Humans do them all the time. Humans are doing them right now somewhere, but they're not doing them out in public. In our culture, those are not things you do out in public. If we were a troop of chimpanzees, those things might be going on now in front of everybody else. It might be perfectly okay for chimpanzees to have sex in front of others or to fight in front of other people. They don't think a thing about it, right? Human beings, we don't do that. And there are reasons for that. We're going to get into some of that later on, uh, especially around sex, why we do it in private 
as opposed to other apes, which other apes, most other apes do it in public. They don't care, right? Anybody here have dogs? Dogs don't care if they have sex in front of you. They don't care if you're having sex. They'll jump on the bed and look at you. They don't care because it's not in their programming to, that, that's not a thing that needs to be private for them. We have this sense of privacy, but these things are sort of uniquely human, right? And so when these, when, these, when these privacy things are broken, then we wonder what's going on, right? Now, let's put this in a different context. Notice these guys behind her with cameras. Now what do you think, why is she there? There's cameras there. Let's say there's cameras, guys with cameras, and there is uh, Heidi Klum. You guys know who Heidi Klum is, a supermodel? Anybody here watch Project Runway? Anybody watch, you guys don't have time to watch bad TV, right? <laughs> Anybody watch Project Runway? All the designers and they're like, they yeah. make the dresses. It's a very, very, very good show. Um, and Heidi Klum is a supermodel who's the hostess, right? So let's say there's a supermodel TV show person there and a bunch of people with camera. Now she's walking naked. Now what do you think? The photo shoot. Do you think she's going to get arrested now? Probably not. I don't know if the president would want a photo shoot of the naked people on the campus, but you know, no such thing as bad publicity, right? So P.T. Barnum said, okay? So it puts it in a different context, right? Let's say that there's, there's movie cameras around and there's <clears throat> movie guys, movie cameras, and movie set people, and people holding, holding, holding boom microphones, and now in the middle of the street there is a bed, and this is a different kind of movie. Now what do you think? People are gonna care? You go, what? The president approved this? Right? Because you realize we live next to the porn capital of the world, right? Valley is the porn capital of the world. Most porn movies are made down in the San Fernando Valley. Right? There's been a big controversy recently. You guys know what that is? That there's been an ordinance that was passed requiring porn actors to wear condoms. And that was came about because a couple porn actors spread, uh, there was a couple cases of AIDS being spread. And somebody said, no, we need to protect them from themselves. Even though the industry as a whole tends to already do a lot of self-policing around uh, protection. But there was a couple cases where it didn't happen. And so somebody said, we need to have a law saying that they have to have condoms. Also, that we want to we want to force the porn industry to, to depict safe sex in pornos. And so that's a bit of big controversy. What you have now is a bunch of porn... Uh, production companies moving out of the area where they go to some place where they don't have to have condoms because when people are watching porn, they don't necessarily want to see, they don't want to be reminded of all the bad AIDS and STDs and everything by seeing people wearing condoms. Right? So there's, this is a controversy. I don't know how it's, if it's been resolved or not, but this has been a controversy. So again, if you saw somebody make a porn movie on campus, you might be wondering what's going on. Different context, right? Different context. That makes sense? Okay, talk about different contexts. Okay. All right. Well, here's another picture for you. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things in this class that most of us would agree are to some degree extreme. They seem really on the edge, like most people would not do this. Now, most of you guys have probably in your lifetime walked around naked in front of another, other people at some point. You know, either somebody, but usually probably somebody you know well. Um, so we wouldn't really necessarily consider nudity to be an extreme thing. But this woman has had hooks put through her skin, and she's hanging from, you know, from from these hooks put in her skin, and they're pulling up her skin. These are actually through her, her body. This is a ritual these people do. Some people like to do this ritual. And this would be something maybe more extreme. Probably most people have not done this and will not do this in their lifetime. Okay. Now, many of these behaviors get identified with being pathological. And I, i.e. that they're maladaptive, they're harmful to self or others, but some will not, okay? Some, some people will not say this is pathological. Some people will say this is actually a healthy expression of creativity or of, um, you know, it, it helps a person release endorphins. There's something, you know, helps a person uh, get into a mental state, which is beneficial. And people who do this sort of thing uh, will say that. They'll, they'll make these claims about these kinds of uh, extreme behaviors. 
Uh, so we're going to see some of these in the class. We're going to talk a lot about this kind of stuff in class, self-mutilation, these kind of things. Okay? And again, you know, depending on your context, you'll either see this as a pathology or you'll see this as something that actually is possibly something that is, that is beneficial. Um, it's hard to identify which sort of behaviors, bizarre, be what we might call bizarre behaviors, are pathological. And we're not going to agree on this. Okay? We can get, we're going to be in a lot of gray area in this class where uh, we have to work to come to some consensus about whether or not the behavior is pathological or not in our, in our viewpoint, in our culture. Okay? And this is especially relevant when we speak of other cultures. One culture's normal is another culture's pathology. And this is an example of women wearing burqas, right? Women wearing burqas, right? You know what a burqa is? They're typically worn by Muslim women, and there are variations of the burqas. This is the full-on, fully covered person. These women are only allowed to go out in public when they're fully covered. And this goes all the way down to women who just have to cover their bodies, to women who have to just wear something over their hair. There's a lot of versions of this. Again, I'm not picking on Muslims, right? No offense if you're Muslim. You know, ethically on my father's side, I come from a Muslim family. They're not. My dad doesn't practice Islam, but his family is ethically Muslim. That's how the British labeled him when he came here as a citizen, because he was a British citizen, a colonial British citizen, and they label people by their 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 religion as an ethnicity. There's a lot of confusion there. That's a very interesting topic, which we're not going to get into. So I'm not picking on Muslims, but this is a good example of cultural relativity. As we look at this, we go, these women are oppressed. They're being controlled by these males who are telling them they must do this. They, they can't show themselves. They, their freedom is curtailed. And, you know, we need to go in there and free them. Because this is screwed up and this, this is messed up. This is no better than slavery. You know, all these kind of things you'll hear. And then sometimes you'll hear from these women who are wearing the burqas that, no, we like wearing burqas. We like this. We consider this a form of freedom. We choose to do this. Who are you Western people to tell us what to do? You Americans, you anti-Muslim people. Who are you to tell us what to do, right? So there is a big controversy over this. And I used to have a clip, I don't think I still have it. Uh, there's a very good interesting clip with Bill Maher, you know, the, the talk show guy, comedian, uh, where he does a burqa fashion show. And he just rips into these people wearing burqas. You know, and it's really, really, it's very, it's funny, but it's very culturally biased, right? Very culturally biased. And so again, you know, you'll see now that there are, there are, there are fashion designers. They have this on the latest episode of Project One Way that I've been watching. They actually have a Muslim woman in there who's doing, who's doing Muslim fashions, and they all include hair covering, right? They all include a hair covering, and I'm trying to remember what the name of the hair covering thing is. I'm forgetting it. There's a name. There's, they all have hair coverings. All the women in the, in the, her fashions have to cover their hair. That's her thing, right? So there's even women who do these burqa kind of things, these Muslim dress restrictions as a fashion statement. So you can find those people now. So again, you know, there's, there's, there's not consensus on this. You know? How would you guys feel? If a woman came to class here and was wearing this, how would you feel? Yeah. I think it'd be, I, I don't think I'd have an opinion, but I think inside I would just look at it and be like, well, it kind of takes the pressure off of having to, you know, Dress and impress, and yeah, these other things yeah, that you worry about yeah, versus, like it's very, it's yeah, wearing. it's the same reason why a lot of private schools require kids to wear uniforms. You know, they can't go and you know, one kid's got you know, the Michael Kors Gucci, you know, outfit on, the other kid's got like stuff they bought at the Goodwill, you know. So, no, everybody has to wear the same thing, so it equalizes everybody, mm -hmm. right? So, that would be a way to look at it. You could also look at it, hey, these women aren't going to get leered at, right? You know, it's eyes up here, right? You know, not going to happen with a burqa. Right? Stare at the whole thing, doesn't matter, you don't see anything, it's shapeless, right? So maybe some women in this women Muslim women have talked about this where they, they feel it frees them from that, from the you know, leering male gaze, right? So you know there may be some positive things about it. Again, we are judging this from our perspective. Okay? You know, but if somebody came in and was in this burqa, I'm sure people would be concerned here. I'm sure they'd be all what's going on there, right? Now, if they were in the burqa light, they wear the head coverings. I've had a number of students, Muslim students, in classes that wear a head covering. Nobody thinks twice about that, right? So there's a level, right? There's a line in the sand. There's a line in the sand where this gets drawn. And each of us has our own line in the sand 
that we go, oh, that's, that's now gone over the edge. It's a little too weird, right? We each have that, okay? And as a culture, we have some relative consensus around those, usually, okay? But, but also as individuals, we have that. Okay. Let me give you another example, which is a little more uh, controversial. This is the example of ritual female circumcision, or what is called female uh, mutilation, female genital mutilation. Okay. This is something that's practiced uh, by uh, women, tribal women in, uh, in, in places in Africa, and also in the Middle East, and some cases uh, by Muslims, other cases non-Muslims. And um, this is something that most Westerners are horrified by. That these young girls, usually they're young age uh, girls, before they reach puberty, they, they are subjected to a, uh, a form of mutilation of their genitals, which is often done in uh, um, uh, septic conditions, and um, and also results in uh, uh, you know problems with sexuality later on, pain, things like that. You can imagine. I'm not going to go into detail how this is done. Um, you can look that up. When I was in public health school, this was a big deal. And they had people, uh, Americans and pe first world people, first world people, of all, of all ethnicities, by the way, uh, who were roundly condemning this. This is something that we need as first world people to go into these countries. We need to stamp out this practice. And we need to set up NGOs, non-governmental organizations that are funded by governments to go in and stamp out this practice. We need to lobby the governments to make this illegal and go in and do this, and they've, by and large, the, they've been able to do this in a lot of places. And everybody here goes, yay, that's great, this is terrible, this is child abuse, this is horrible, right? And then when I was at Harvard, there was a woman who was from uh, one of these African countries who was grown, grown woman, who said, wait a minute, you know, this is the tradition of our people, and who are you, mostly white first world people to tell us what to do. We've had enough of your colonial interference. Enough of you people coming from your rich countries and telling us how to live our lives and what to do. This is our ritual. You may not like it. You may not understand it. But we think this is uh, good. This is the way that we live. This is the, what we do. And you have no right to come and tell us not to do this. And this woman, who was now Harvard educated, uh, as a grown woman, went back to her country her tribe to undergo the ritual. She hadn't undergone it as a child. And she went back to voluntarily undergo to have this done. And, um, you know, and brought the viewpoint up. But wait a minute, you know, you guys are imposing your Western first world country values on us third world people. This is another form of colonization, right? Another place that you're treating us unequally, you're, you're colonizing, you're telling us what to do, you're controlling our behavior, and it's unacceptable. And so you had this sort of counter backlash. Now that backlash, by the way, was um, small compared to the amount of people who condemn this kind of thing. And you know, you can have your own personal viewpoint about this. Personally, I think it's horrible. Um, I'm, I, especially because it's being done to children. We don't have a choice in the matter. You know. But there are reasons that people did this. And the reasons that people do this, we're not exactly sure why, but it might have been related to the slave trade. We mutilate these women, and they're less desirable as slaves, and so then, you know, people won't come and steal them away. Western people won't come and steal them away. Or other tribes won't come and steal them away and make them into slaves, right? That's one possible explanation. There are other explanations, too, depending on what you want to look at. Oh, this is a way of the men who ran, ran the thing were afraid of female sexuality. It's a way for men to control women. There's all sorts of different explanations floated out there for this stuff. But this is an area where there is some cultural you know, um, differences in opinion about these things. Now, what's happened is that a lot of countries have, have made this illegal. The governments have, you know, been pressured by the Western first world countries to make this illegal. They've made it illegal. Um, but in a lot of places, it's still practiced because it's very difficult to actually, um, actually uh, 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 police the people who are doing this. And there's variations. There's, there's, there's variations where it's a really, really very invasive, very serious mutilation. And there's places where it's done very symbolically, like taking a pen and, you know, drawing a little blood, and that's it. Right? Depending where you are, there's, there's a lot of variations in how this actually occurs. But this is an area where most of us, 
would think, wow, this is terrible. But there are people who would disagree with that. There are people who disagree with that. What happens here in the Western world? What happened until very recently, just like maybe 20 years ago, right? Male babies were, were typically circumcised after birth, right? It's also a form of genital mutilation, okay? They don't anesthetize the babies either. They do this without anesthesia. They used to do it without anesthesia. Okay? And um, nobody ever complained about this. Yeah, yes? Hey, uh, can, it be, can it like that, that was big, what, in the 50s, is the mommy stitch or the daddy stitch where the females, if they have ripped, you know, their vagina during childbirth, the fathers would actually go and request that their wife have an extra stitch or two placed in. Yes, women would get a episiotomy at birth. Yeah. And what would happen is they would they would call it the, there's numerous names for it, one is the husband stitch. Uh, the lot, a lot of doctors will do that even today, um, basically as just routine. But can that be considered a mutilation? Because there are plenty of women that say that it, it causes it, them pain after. And yes, it just depends. Yes. Yes. The doctor just, yeah. Let me just do an extra stitch for you and not yeah. get your consent. Yeah. Back in the day, that was pretty. Well, even still done pretty routinely. Though so now they'll tell. They have to tell you they're going to do it. Yeah. Done pretty routinely. So yeah, there's a lot of this stuff going on. Now we're going to talk about genital mutilation in the form of castration in a lot of detail later. So I'm not going to go into this stuff. But just to mention, it is cultural activity. You have people who are going out telling Africans not to do this female ritual, general ritual, mutilation ritual, and who have had their sons circumcised, right? So you've got to wonder, that you look at the hypocrisy, right? Again, you know, circumcision doesn't necessarily affect the sexual function. You know, it depends who you ask. You know, at least if it's affecting, it's not affecting it, you know, in too serious a way. You know, so there may be some differences in, in, um, in extremity. But nevertheless, you know, the idea is these babies aren't being asked for consent to do this, right? So again, you have to put things in sort of culturally relative terms. And if you start looking at these things, you'll see a lot of hypocrisy, right? Okay, you'll see a lot of hypocrisy. So we'll, we'll run into some things like this throughout the semester. All right. Um, we're not going to answer the question in this class about what is absolutely pathological and absolutely what isn't. Okay, we're not going to have come up with a lot of universal things. We'll use, we can use a lot of psychology to look at things and wonder why people act certain ways. Okay? Um, and we'll do that. Like this is the person I'll talk to them about later. This is a guy who's decided to make himself look like a cat. And uh, he's got his eyes. You can see his eyes are like little cat slit eyes. That, that probably it's a probably contact lens. He's got whisker piercings. He's got his face structure has been redone, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we don't have to ask ourselves a question. Is this pathological or is this this guy's just sort of creative expression? Right? So we'll, we'll get into some of this stuff. Just because a behavior is weird doesn't mean it's pathological. And just because a behavior seems normal doesn't mean it's not pathological. And we'll talk about some things like that. And this is what we're going to do. You guys know all the, the metaphor of the elephant and the blind people. So, you know, this guy's over here. They're trying to describe the elephant. This guy goes, oh, it's sharp and pointy. This guy goes, oh, it's kind of like a snake. This guy goes, it's like a tree trunk. This guy goes, it's like a wall. This guy goes, it's like a fan. This guy is not the one I want to be. Um, you know, and so none of them individually can describe what this elephant is. But if you take all their observations together, they may be able to come up with some rough sketch of what this elephant is. And you can think of bizarre behavior uh, sort of in this way. Right. If we sort of look at a lot of these different things, we may get some, some, some ideas and some parameters around what it is we mean by bizarre behavior. That's one thing the class is going to attempt to do. Whether it pulls it off successfully or not, I don't know. But I think the attempt is, attempt is worthwhile. Okay. And again, if you think of these as all different fields, we have psychology, medicine, you know, anthropology, sociology, biology, you know, again, you can think of these things. We really need all these different fields to really try to get a grasp on what it is we're talking about in this class. Now, some pathological behaviors are so common, 
in our culture that we've sort of lost a lot of curiosity about them. Um, and we're not going to talk about those much in this class. So this woman has anorexic, and anorexia is a known psychological disorder. There's known treatments. There's all sorts of things here. We're not going to talk tremendously about this because this is something you're going to get in Psych 313. You'll, you'll learn about anorexia and bulimia and these kind of things, these sort of typical Western diagnoses. We're going to probably be more interested in the stuff that's a little bit either more obvious and not considered pathological or stuff that is more extremely pathological. Um, and really good examples of this are in our, our eating behavior. Uh, most people look at Americans and think we are absolutely crazy when it comes to our eating behavior. Our eating behavior is very pathological. As you guys may know, as a uh, country, we are becoming more obese. I'm unfortunately a good example of that. Um, uh, there's a lot of health consequences to our eating behavior, tremendous amounts of health consequences. And um, in People in other countries just think we're nuts, right? The, the, our rates of obesity in America and in first world countries are really going through the roof. And you see other places don't have this, these problems. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Okay. Um, many other cultures will look at the quantity and quality of the food and, and the way we eat and label our behavior as really bizarre. Somebody from Vietnam looks at how the average American eats and just thinks like that person is just really bizarre, right? And so this is what you see. And again, this is reflected in, in levels of obesity and health things, uh, preventable health uh, problems. Okay? And from the outside, if you look at America, for instance, from the outside, our eating patterns look like a culture-bound syndrome. Because you go to other cultures, they use Vietnam as an example, you don't have people who have the same problems who eat like we do in America, none of the same problems. Very, very low rates of obesity in places like Vietnam, okay? where you have maybe one to a couple percent people are obese, as opposed to the Western world where you have like 30 percent of people. Now they're saying America is edging toward being 50 percent of people are going to be obese in America, technically obese. So that's a big difference. Yes? Uh, have you ever heard of mukbanging? What's that? Mukbanging? I have not heard it's that. It's like in America, it's like scarf like a video of like you scarf. Oh. It's gross, disgusting, like people dipping crab into like cheese sauce. Yeah, all, yeah. yeah. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. I'll talk to you when we get to fetishes. I'll talk to you a little bit about feeders. So remind me. I think, I, I think I'm on one of the TV shows that has that. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk about that. It's, it's a little similar. Yeah. There. Adds a little sexual component to it, but it's similar. But yeah, we've had pie eating contests and all those kind of things. You know, you don't go to Vietnam and find people having pie eating contests. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it doesn't exist. So, but this is, and we have fast food here, right? What happens when McDonald's gets exported to other countries? What do you start seeing, right? Some little bit more obesity, not everywhere. I've been to Japan a couple times. They have lots of McDonald's in Japan. You don't see a lot of obese people in Japan, right? So it's, this is a Western thing. This is a Western American, North, North uh, you know, European uh, kind of thing. Um, and so again, this is something that we, you know, other people think we're really weird. We don't think it's normal. We don't think anything of it, right? Just like we don't think of anything of the size of our vehicles, right? Anybody here travel to other countries? Anybody seen a lot of Escalades cruising around? Not, not the dictators, you know, ex exempted. They're driving around in their bulletproof Escalades, right? But common people are not driving around in giant Escalades, right? If they have cars at all, they're small, they're fuel efficient. You know, they get one car, they might keep it their whole life. It's not the same as here. Right? So again, we have, there's real cultural differences here. Um, I was going to show you this guy, just to show you some, to talk a little bit about, the other thing we're going to see in this class are people who are just doing sort of extreme things, extreme humans. And uh, I like to give you this guy as an example, his name is Miran Dajo. And he uh, supposedly, I think he was a Dutch guy or something, he went to India and supposedly learned how to do these sort of um, extreme behavior of being able to uh, uh, insert uh, sharp pointy objects through his body. I think I had a video of him somewhere. Oh, the video didn't show up. Uh, there's some videos of him. Do I have time to show the videos? I might have time. Let me see if I can find this one second. You should see this. It's actually kind of interesting to watch it.
You see a video of him. Let's get to the good parts here. So what he would do is he would go and he would um, he would do uh, demonstrations. Let's see if I can go back here. There we go. Sorry. So you go do demonstrations of this, and you have doctors there and people there to uh, to watch this going on. Demonstrate this is true. <coughs> so one of the things we'll talk about in this class are people who do these sort of extreme. Uh, things from extreme human repertoires. So that's a real sharp, pointy thing, and he's now going to stab this guy through the body with it. So what do you think? Magic? No, because it took an x-ray of it. So it's actually going through the body. <laughs> So what do you think? Is he defying the laws of physics? Is he some superhuman? Yeah. They show a like sharp, pointy thing going through his body. <laughs> well, I mean, like, with his... That looks like it's going to be going through some organs. <laughs> like, what? You think, huh? How do you think he does this? Scar tissue. Scar tissue is a good, good guess. So what he's done is, he has, over a period of time, put it in... And then, a little, and, then, and, then, and then some scar tissue is developed. Put a little further, scar tissue is developed. Doing this very slowly until there's like a tube of scar tissue. Until it goes all the way through his body. And, he's, and then avoiding the organs and then able to go through. So something you know, they're doing, you know, EKGs on the guy to see, you know, how is he, you know. And so that's why, that's, they think that's how he did it. I think there's a way he did that. And, Again, this is another bizarre behavior. Again, we saw some guy with a sword going through, you'd freak out. But, you know, again, there's no, there's no, you can't get around the laws of physics, right? We live in a universe that's constrained by certain physical laws. You know, life, biology is constrained by certain things. You can't get around that. So, you know, we're not talking about magic here, okay? So some of these bizarre behaviors will seem really strange, you know, we may not understand what's going on, but there's something going on. Just because we haven't explained it yet doesn't mean that it is, is beyond the realm of science or it's something supernatural. And this is especially true when we're going to talk a little bit in a couple of weeks about demonic possession. Okay? Just keep that in mind. I just thought I'd show you a little bit of this guy. This is kind of interesting. Um, you guys know, if you've been in class with me, you know that I like Freud a lot. And um, one thing I want to mention is that we'll find a lot of the behaviors that we look at in this class will have elements of aggression and violence as well as sexuality as part of them. As Freud said, you know, human motivation is, you know, eros and thanatos, sex and aggression. And what we're going to see is a lot of, a lot of mixture of these things, depending on one more than the other depending on the behavior what we're looking at uh, of, of sex and aggression. Here's a fetish, by the way, of uh, guys who like to watch this. Usually guys watch fetish stuff. They're usually masturbating these things. This is a, a fetish where guys like to watch women basically kicking the crap out of some other guy. So here's a woman basically kicking this guy in the head, beating the crap out of him. The guys are watching this and masturbating to it. That's a typical fetish. Right? So here's one that's a perfect good example of Eros and Thanatos going together. Right? We're going to get into a little bit later on the reasons why some men might find this to be uh, stimulating. Okay, and that'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But just in a lot of things we're going to talk about, look for the arrows and thanatos. Look for the arrows and thanatos in them. Because it's probably going to be there to some degree. Okay. My favorite picture, arrows and thanatos. It's Batgirl and Supergirl, right? Um, a lot of times these things go together. Eros and Thanatos go together. They're mixed up together. This is, there's a wonderful word for this. Uh, this is called, um, I'm blanking on it now. This is called, uh, what do I want to say? Condensation. Okay. 
or it could be symbols of things that, that go together. That one symbol may have multiple meanings. And one of the things you'll see in these symbols a lot of times is uh, Eros and Thanatos going together. Okay, so they often go together. And again, you look at that in the behaviors we're going to talk about in this class. We're also going to approach everything looking at bizarre behavior. We're going to use a lot of explanations from human evolution and our evolutionary past, and I'll make some uh, uh, um, correspondence with our great ape cousins, especially chimpanzees and bonobos, okay, and maybe some of the large uh, gorillas as well. Okay. Um, I, am, I consider myself to be, you know, my undergrad degree was in biology, and I consider uh, evolution and evolutionary biology to be really important. I see a lot of the a lot of the, 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 the roots of human behavior in evolution. And a lot of the explanations for why humans do certain things can be traced back evolutionarily to, um, at least to primates and to primate behavior. Okay? We have an excellent primatologist in our faculty here, uh, Professor Campbell, Matt Campbell, and he does a class in animal behavior. And I encourage all of you guys to take that class. Really fascinating stuff you're going to learn there. A lot more detail than we're going to be able to get into in here. But I like this stuff a lot. If you don't believe in evolution, then, um, you know, again, I'm going to put, I, you know, as a person, I think you're entitled to whatever religious beliefs you want to have, and I respect those. As a psychologist, I'm going to say that, that you know, the, 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 the mechanisms of evolution, a natural selection, are incontrovertible and can be demonstrated in a laboratory. My sister-in-law does uh, research on fruit, fruit flies, where you can have, in a short amount of time, many, many, many generations and she can absolutely show you with fruit flies in a short amount of time, a couple months, you know, how natural selection actually functions. That, that uh, you can change the context of the, or the living situation of fruit flies and you can see uh, you know, random mutations becoming, uh, cert, cert, you know, that are, that are beneficial. You know, the animals that, that have more of those are reproducing more and then pretty soon that mutation becomes, becomes part of the animal's uh, heritage. Okay? So natural selection is incontrovertible. And anybody who tells you evolution is not true is just ignorant, unfortunately. You know, now, again, if you want to believe something else, that's up to you. But, you know, as far as, you know, you know putting our scientific thinking caps on, evolution is really, uh, really incontrovertible. And because it's called evolutionary theory does not mean it is merely a hypothesis. Okay? It is something that is really fairly proven fact. And a lot of the creationists who argue against evolution have very specious arguments. For instance, they'll say there's not a lot of intermediate animals that you'd see if things evolved, and you know, so therefore things must have just sprung into existence because God willed them to be that way. And the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of intermediate forms of animals in the fossil record, tons and tons and tons of them, and you find them all over the place. And I've got a very, very good book on this. If anybody really interested and wants to read it, I'm happy to let you uh, let you take a look at it. Um, I'm not going to get into religious arguments about here. You could argue, well, you know, maybe you had to have God make the first spark of life or whatever. I'm not going to argue that, you know. But as far as natural selection, evolution is concerned, and related to human beings, there is a huge, huge um, amount of our behavior that can at least, at least the, 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 the basis of it can be seen in primates. And so we're going to talk a lot about that in this class. And especially when we talk about stuff related to sex, sexuality, and mating patterns and things like that. And we have some important differences as well. We'll talk about those. So here are all the things we're going to talk about. We talked about these before. I mentioned these before. Um, this guy is a Hindu sadhu. We're going to talk about people who do body modifications for spiritual reasons. I also talk about this in my 344 class a little bit. So we'll talk about these guys a little bit uh, later on in the semester. Um, other things we're not going to, we could get into in more depth, we're not going to get into, uh, uh, you know, just going to have the time. There's, again, I could easily do two versions of this class, and eventually I want to do that, and I'll do more of that later on. But uh, for you guys, there'll be some stuff we won't get into, okay, uh, just because just we don't have the time. Um, this is a picture of, of, of a, a feeding fetish. Uh, this guy has a fetish where he likes to be sat on by very large women, and he likes to feed them. And to make them large. This is a fetish. Uh, they're called feeders. And there's some women who um, actually force feed themselves to get really big in order to um, service these men. They make a lot of money. They do well. They get a lot of attention. Lots of reasons they do it. And again, there's a TV show with this on. 
uh, human relationship to animals. We're going to talk a little bit about that, not in a lot of detail. Uh, we're, going to, uh, we're not going to talk about human dolls very much. Um, again, these are all stuff that are on the on the TV show. Live action role playing, LARPing, very interesting thing. We're not going to have a lot of time to get into them. And objectum sexuality, which we will talk a little bit about. Okay. I won't let tell you what that is. We'll leave that as a surprise for later. Okay. Um, vampires, people who think they're horses, cannibalism, <laughs> uh, alien abduction. We're going to get into all those things. Okay. This, see, this is alien abduction because now what? Is that she's pregnant with an alien, but actually that's not a she. That's a he. Okay, male pregnancy, we're probably not going to talk too much about. Okay? But we're going to get into all these kind of things, weird things, uh, body modifications, tattoos, scarification, talk about a lot of that stuff. Okay? So that's what the class is.